Hey team, it's your nurse educator Amy here and welcome to the final part in our series on hemodynamics. In this video, I'm going to be discussing contractility and the role it plays in the perfusion status of your patient. So let's get started. Now remember, contractility is the final variable that's going to determine stroke volume and ultimately cardiac output. Now contractility is the ventricle's ability to pump out blood to either the lungs or the body. Now there are a couple of different parameters that we can use to assess the contractility status of the ventricles. Now. I'm going to be discussing some of the more common ones. Depending on the type of unit that you work in, you may use more advanced uh, parameters than even these, um, but those are going to be definitely more advanced and really seen in more of a CVICU or an ECMO unit setting. Now, probably the variable that we're going to see used the most, the parameter, is ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is the percentage of blood that is pumped out of the left ventricle with each beat. And this is very easy to obtain. We can usually get this one just off of an echo. Now, a normal ejection fraction is between 50 and 70%. Now, that surprises a lot of people because um, normally we would be thinking, oh, well, wouldn't it be like 100% of the blood that's pumped out with each, with each beat? But no, actually there is going to be a decent amount of volume that's left in each of the ventricles after the contraction. Um, and really we're looking at, in a normal person, between 30 and up to 50% of that blood volume is going to remain in the ventricle. Isn't that crazy? Now, ultimately, the worse the patient's heart is, the harder it is for those ventricles to pump out blood, and we would see this number fall. So in our really advanced heart failure patients, you may see ejection fractions of less than 20%. So that would mean a majority of that volume is left in the ventricle, and that can lead to a lot of problems later on down the line. So. Uh, we don't want to see that number um, fall as it can lead to more problems. Now, these other two parameters are looking at the end diastolic volume that's left in each of the ventricles before the contraction occurs. So you can have left ventricular end diastolic volume and right ventricular end diastolic volume. On the left side, it, a normal volume would be about 120 mils of blood, and on the right side, it can go up to 160. So again, this is the amount of volume that's left in the ventricles before the contraction occurs. So in our patients with heart failure or developing heart failure, you would see this number go up as it represents the ventricles not doing their job properly, right? More blood is left sitting in there before each contraction. Now, obviously, like we've been alluding to, the main problem that we think of when we think of contractility is heart failure. Now, lucky for us, we have several different options when it comes to fixing those problems. On the medication side of things, we have our positive inotropic agents. Inotrope is just a fancy word for contraction. So positive inotropes are going to improve the contractility of the heart and ultimately the heart's ability to pump out that blood. So things like dopamine, dobutamine, digoxin, I call those the D drugs. <laughs> We also have epinephrine and milrinone in this family as well. Now, one thing to remember with these drugs uh, is that they're also going to increase the workload of the heart. They're going to increase the stress that the heart is under. And if we don't ensure that there is enough oxygen to supply the heart with this increased stress and workload, we can really put the patient at risk for ischemia. So that is definitely a huge thing we need to be mindful of when we're administering these drugs. Now, some other interventions that we can do that are not medicines 
are mechanical devices. So things like impellas, balloon pumps, LVADs, that's going to increase the ability of the ventricles to pump out blood, depending on where that device is placed in the heart. Now, if we wanted to decrease the heart's ability to contract, that would be a negative inotropic agent. And so this would be things like your beta blockers and your calcium channel blockers. Now, some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, Amy, <laughs> most of my heart failure patients are on these medications. Wouldn't we want to increase the ability of the heart to pump out blood? Well, yes, but remember what I said with the positive inotropic agents, these are going to increase the workload of the heart. So we will have the patient on a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker to decrease the stress, to decrease the workload of the heart. And then in addition to that, we may have them on an ACE inhibitor to decrease the pressure that the heart has to pump against. So doing that combination, you would actually improve the heart's ability to pump out that blood. I know it's very complex, but that side effect is really, really significant that you're really increasing the oxygen demands and the workload of the heart. And we really don't want that with our heart failure patients. Now, if we have patients that develop heart failure that are in the ICU, absolutely, you may see these agents being used, but we're able to more closely monitor, the, monitor them in an ICU or PCU setting as opposed to them being at home. So just a little caveat there. Now, as you can see, out of all of the variables that we discussed when determining cardiac output, this is the one that's the most complex you're gonna really have to rely on working with your team to help monitor and provide the necessary interventions to improve this variable, as there's a lot of different things you have to think about. So I hope that this really helped you. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any more of my videos, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys.